Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, March 30th. Praise the Lord, we are back in our study. If you're looking on video, we did miss last week due to a missions conference, but we are back on. We will be picking up in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 3, about verse 24, but let's back up just slightly to verse 22, get our thought in here. Remember, we're coming through the time that because of the sin of Adam and Eve, that uh, they have gone their own way, they did not follow in obedience to the Lord their God, and there are consequences for this. So we looked in depth and detail in the class before at the, the curse or the judgment that came on man, on woman, on the earth, and especially on Satan. We even saw his total and hallelujah, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> but we did see also that in the midst of this judgment being poured out and being given, that it was not given without any kind of hope. We have our great first prophecy of the coming Messiah, the seed of the woman, in Genesis 3.15, that her seed would do battle with Satan and his seed, his followers, and the victory, of course, would go to Messiah, to the, the seed of the woman, which speaks to virgin birth, because he, even though he came fully as man, he was born of the Spirit within Miriam's womb, Mary's womb, so that he did not have the sin nature. He was not, he was fully God and fully man at the same time, able to deliver us from this penalty of sin, which is death. We saw that uh, God provided redemption for mankind. He did not for the angels when they fell. I think because they fell in the very presence of God. They lived in, in heaven with him in that very environment. Satan wanted to be in God's place. Those who wanted to put Satan on that throne, they are the ones who all fell with Satan. But we see that God reached down to his human that he created in his image and provided a way of uh, salvation, redemption for them. We saw that the, the gospels portrayed in this, we get a whole gospel sermon in this, and just to remind you, we saw that to approach God, the guilty sinner needs a covering. Remember Adam and Eve's covering was gone because <coughs> they saw themselves naked. They did not have the glory of the Lord surrounding them now. So to approach God, the guilty sinner needs a covering. That covering made by hands, any works of man, is not acceptable. There's nothing man can do, and we'll continue to see that as we go into our next major story of Ka'an and Abel, Cain and Abel. But right now, just enough to say the covering made by hands. They covered themselves with leaves. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't acceptable. God himself provided their covering. And there is our beautiful picture that it is his work and his work alone that redeems us. He provides everything we need for redemption. What is that that he supplies or provides? The necessary covering can, that we need can only be obtained through a death because we need shed blood. We need sinless blood to be shed. The animals that lost their lives are a picture that all it could do was temporarily cover. It couldn't wash away the sin. Yeshua's perfect shed blood could wash away the sin. And God provided that blood. We know from, we're not there yet, but Leviticus, Viacra, Vaikra. Let me say it right, sorry, Vaikra in my Hebrew. Leviticus chapter 17 and 11 tells us the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I, God, have provided on the altar for forgiveness of sin. For uh, Without the, the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Hebrews 9 and verse 22. So God did it all. The guilty sinner needs a covering. God provides the covering. How did he provide? By providing himself. He gave his blood, the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. We see that God is offering that way of redemption, that way of coming back into a right fellowship with our God, being able to spend an eternal life with him when we leave this earth. Hallelujah. But God did a huge favor for us. In verse 22, we find out that God did not want Adam and Eve in that sinful state that they're in now to live forever that way. And I say, hallelujah. 
otherwise what you and I are suffering now we would be suffering forever mm -hmm. it would be it would go on and on and when we hear the evils of this world if you were privy to our prayer Tim just before we started this class the horrors that are taking place I am so thankful to know this will come to an end and there is an eternal life that we are promised that is perfection love that is surrounded by his grace that never a lie will even enter in and all the consequences that comes from it so God in his love toward us limited our life we do die physically on this earth the only way we don't is if we are raptured for those who are alive in the day that the Lord comes back for those who is in their hearts are the ones who get to escape this otherwise what comes to every man when you're born you're beginning to die <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. all there is to it we know scientifically that's true but God speaking and when he says let uh, speaking uh, in the plural then God said where is it it's in the plural somewhere in verse 22 um, okay yeah there we go behold the man has become like one of us God speaking in his triunity at that point. God the Father speaking with God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh, the three in one. He's not speaking to anyone else. He's speaking to, to who is equal to him. And he's saying, lest man reach out, eat from that tree of life and live forever in this sinful state. He knew that, that they still needed to know how to walk with him, how to have fellowship with him, as is true for us today. But he didn't want them to live in that state forever. So he only mm -hmm. is going to allow them to eat from the tree that gives them eternal life after they leave this earth now. Let me show you where this tree is. Go with me to Revelation to the end. We're in the beginning, but let's go all the way to the end. I love the fact that we can read the last chapter. Uh, some of you, that might be a spoiler. For me, it's hallelujah. <laughs> I want to know how it turns out. Where in Revelation? Revelation chapter 22. Well, no, let's start. Let's start at 2. Let's go in order. We'll start at 2. Verse 2? Chapter 2 and verse 7. That will end up in chapter 22. That sums it all up. But in chapters 2 and 3, God's speaking to the churches. He's giving a message to the churches, which covers the entire church age, which we're at the end of, but in John's day it was the beginning of. But it's also, it, it is true throughout the whole time. Okay, so to this church, he said, that He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. That's to the Holy Spirit, to the churches. To him who overcomes, and who's the overcomer? You overcome by your faith, 1 John 5, 4. The overcomer is the one who has faith in God and in his salvation. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Okay, so we're told right away the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden, that God is now blocking the way from Adam and Eve eating and, and living forever on this earth in their sinful state, that tree is now in the paradise of God. Well, where's the paradise of God? Heaven. heaven you got it I'll back up that point real well if we get far enough in class today so hang in there and we'll see that <coughs> in a whole lot more now run with me to chapter 21 on the way to um, 22 we'll stop off in chapter 21 when you take Revelation in order chapter 1 is, the, is of the past it showed the glory of God it, it showed a picture that you go through it and you absolutely cannot separate <coughs> whether it's talking about Jehovah the Father or God the Son, you'll see it's intertwined all the way through because I believe it's speaking of both. Chapters 2 and 3 are the present, it's the church age, speaking to the seven churches. Chapter 4 starts with the words, come up here, and John's caught up to heaven to see a heavenly scene, chapters 4 and 5, and then he sees what happens on the face of the earth, chapters 6 through 19, the things which come hereafter. This outline, by the way, is Revelation 1, 19, that John was to write the things which were past, the things which are, and the things which will be hereafter. Same words, same Greek words, in 1, 19 and in 4, 1. There's your connection. After the church, here's the, the heavenly scene, and then we see on the earth is a tribulation. We get through 19, we have the return of the Lord in his second coming. Rapture and second coming are two totally different events. In when he comes 
for his saints, and the other he comes with his saints. Total different picture. Don't put them together. I heard someone do that recently. I'm not here to expound on that, but if you need a teaching on that, I've got that available. So, chapter 19 has us coming back with the Lord. He stops the battle of Armageddon. We all know that's the end of the tribulation period. Chapter 20, he sets up the thousand-year millennial kingdom. Called millennial because millennial means thousand. Thousand years that the earth knows peace because the Lord is ruling. He's ruling with a rod of iron, and he's ruling from where? Heaven. Heaven. Oh, Jerusalem. Wow. He's sitting on earth. He's ruling from Jerusalem. That's oh, what I was at. Yes, he's ruling from heaven it's also. It is the will of heaven mm -hmm. on earth now, too. He is ruling from Jerusalem, comma, Israel, the eternal capital of Israel. Throw that in for free. Okay, so <laughs> the end of 20 has the end of the millennium. Now we're looking at a new heavens and a new earth in 21 and 22, which will take us into an eternity future that we only have the fair beginning information for. God's going to tell us a whole lot more one day, but not in his word of God here. So in 21, verse 1, we have, I see a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, the first earth passed away, there's no longer any sea. So we have our time when we're talking about. Now drop down to verse 5. Verse 5 says, he who sits on the throne, we know who that is, says, behold, are yeah. you awake? Are you yeah, paying behold. attention? <laughs> behold, I think that's number 30 in, Re in the book of Revelation alone. Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, right, for these things, these words are faithful and true. Okay, so he's telling us what is going on. It's the word of God. It's the Lord speaking to us. He's telling us about the new heavens and the new earth. I'm going to jump and go just a little further on you now into chapter 22. Continuing because 21 and 22, just keep rolling. The whole book is in order. Chapter 22, we have verse 1. And I rolled past it. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So we know we're seeing the new heavens. We're seeing, well, we're seeing God's heaven. So I can't say it's the new, but anyway, we are seeing his heaven. We are seeing the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of it, the, its street. Verse 20, I mean, sorry, verse 2 of chapter 22 on either side of the river. So this river comes from the throne. It forms like a street. On either side, we see the tree of life. That's where it is. That cl clarifies that paradise is in God's heaven, and that's where the tree of life is. Up there in heaven, it is bearing uh, 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the and it says for the healing of the nations, which makes it sound like somebody gets sick. But the way it's meant from the Greek is they, they medicinally keep them well. So it, it's like it keeps them from illness. It keeps it enables them to live forever because of the properties that's within it that God has put in there. So that's where the tree of life is. In our resurrected state, when we've been given that new body that lasts forever, when we don't have blood in our body anymore, it's flesh and bone like Yeshua Jesus had when he rose from the dead. That's when we'll get to eat. We actually get to eat from the tree of life. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I, I love fruit. fruit. <laughs> I, yeah, I want to know what fruit too. But I guarantee you when we eat that fruit, we're going to say, I thought that cantaloupe was good, or I thought that apple was good, or that strawberry that I or ate durian. the other day. <laughs> Every once in a while we get a taste of something that we say, oh, that's heavenly. Uh, obviously it's very good, but the best is yet to come. So that's when we too will get to eat from the tree of life. That will be open to us. Okay? We're going to talk more about that in a bit, so I'm going to rush us back into Bereshit, into Genesis, go back to chapter 3, and we will pick up, I think we're ready... Yeah, the end of 22 was saying, you know, lest he stretch out his hand, eat from the tree of life, and live forever. So, verse 23, therefore, the Lord God sent him, and the him is conclusive, it's Adam and Eve, okay? He sent them, I'll say, out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. I think that's why he's giving it in the, the male only because it's the male who is now going to have to work that ground to provide the food for him. He worked with the ground before, but it was all joy. There wasn't thorns and thistles and weeds and bowl evils and 
all the little nasty things that destroy the crops and all of that. So we talked about the planting of tomatoes today and the hope that those <laughs> tomatoes will grow. And, and I said, I grew great tomato worms and even put up the marigolds to keep the tomato worms away, which did work, but my tomatoes still never grew. Hopefully there's a better crop for someone else. But heaven, none of those problems when we get back to what God wanted originally, we will not have these issues. But Adam's not going to deal with the tomato worms and all the rest that goes along with it, the, the weather conditions, everything. So, this is judgment. The Hebrew makes it very clear they're being sent away. They're being sent away from the Garden of Eden. As that happens, the judgment is concluding what we call that first dispensation. If you remember way back, because we even skipped a class here in between, there are seven dispensations we see in Scripture. The first one being innocence. Adam and Eve were innocent. They didn't know evil. Now they know evil. So innocence is now ended. They're going to live in a time, the next dispensation. Dispensation is a period of time that God sets down rules. Man's going to fail, there is a judgment or consequence that comes from it. But it's to show man that no matter what your conditions, no matter what scenario you want to come up with, no one can come up and live on that holy standard of living that is the only acceptable unto God. If God allows even one sin into heaven, look what would come of it. Look at this world. It all came from one sin. Okay, so. Nothing short of that perfect standard can be allowed, and that's what God's showing. So now Adam and Eve are going to live in the time called conscience. They have a conscience. They now know evil. That conscience can prick at them. That's not good. Don't do that. That's evil. This is good. Walk in that way. They're going to have to, to be obedient to their conscience. And we're going well, to see... Adjusted. That, adjusted. Would that be a good word? Adjusted to... The conscience of good and evil? There, yes, they would have to adjust to that. This, this is a new way. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. But we're going to see what happens. And if you want a sneak peek, I'll give you the sneak peek. We get our first murder. Hello. <laughs> Man fails miserably. You know, it doesn't matter. So you can't stand before God and say, well, if you gave me perfect parents, well, who were Adam and Eve's parents or parent? You know, it's God. They blew it. Well, if you give me the perfect environment, well, God put them in the Garden of Eden. It doesn't get any better than that. They didn't eat from the tree because they were hungry, and that was the only <coughs> food that was around. Yeah. It was temptation. It was desired. You know, we went down that path. In conscience, no one's going to be able to say, well, if you had just left it to me, I've got a good conscience. I would live a good life. Mm -hmm. No one would live it perfectly. And you'll see that through every dispensation down through time. Because Genesis doesn't cover all seven of those dispensations, if you want more information, I've got another teaching on that because that takes a class or two at least to, to do it justice. So if you want that, let me know, and, and I'll make that available to you. But now they're going to live with the results of sin. And sin is separation. It has kept them off from that fellowship with God that they had with nothing in the way. God came down and walked in the cold of the evening, talked with them. We have no idea how long that went on, but we know that that was something that they were accustomed to because they knew once they had sinned, uh-oh, God's coming, we got to hide. So obviously this was something that was a familiarity to them. When we look at verse 24, it says that, that so he, God, drove the man out. That sounds from the Hebrew even stronger. He expelled them. He pushed them, so to speak. Almost what I think we get from this is a reluctance on Adam's part. Can you imagine? That's been paradise for them on earth. It's mm -hmm. been wonderful. They don't even know what's outside of that garden, what they're going to be going into. And I, I do imagine that God's telling them, you have to go, you have to leave, you cannot stay here where you have access to this tree now. I can imagine, you know, Adam's taking slow steps and, and probably looking back and maybe even wanting to bargain with God, but before he even tries, because we don't read of any of that. This is just my reading in. But God, before that, is forcing it. You have to go. This is the consequence of your actions. Yes? What I wanted to ask is, um, when Adam was with God, 
the serpent was never there. But where did he come from when Eve appeared? It seemed like she was the weaker vessel and he just targeted her out of that node. He, he, she wasn't weaker in the sense we don't have sin which makes weak and strong. So it wasn't in that way. But she was deceived. She, he pulled the wool over her eyes. He tempted her, fooled her. That's looked at it by our standards of a weaker mind. So where did he come but, from? Say? Well, his kingdom was this earth. Oh. We went through that. His kingdom was this earth before God judged it, which is the chaos we read in Genesis 1-2. God reestablishes it uh, inhabitable, forms man and puts man over this, makes it his dominion. <clears throat> well, Satan says, that was mine. I'm not giving that up. I'm going after it. I'm going to get the man to follow me because I want to be worshipped anyway. That's what he's been after from, I was going to say from day one, but you know, from the beginning. So he came at Adam in his domain, in what was Satan's kingdom. Oh. He, I do believe, came at a time to Eve when Adam wasn't around because the story is very clear. Eve took and gave the fruit to Adam, so obviously it was a time they worked together. Someone says, well, that was a sin. No, I don't think so, because you didn't have sin yet. To me, the first sin is eating the fruit, because that's what God said. God didn't say to Adam, thou shalt never leave thy wife's side. Mm -hmm. But God did say, thou shalt not eat from the tree. But Satan knew she wouldn't be as strong with her husband with the one that God spoke specifically to and gave that to and we know God made her to be the helpmate to him which we went into all of that meaning that's not subjection that's not less than that God made Adam and gave Adam the commandment to do to you know in accordance with his will and made Eve to be Adam's helpmate to help Adam do what God had called Adam to do so at the time when when Satan knew he could influence her more he snuck in. He, he came in the guise of that serpent. Beautiful. Not today, but back then. <laughs> and he came in that, that disguise, and then he began to manipulate the words of God. You know, did God say, you know, put doubt in her mind, and worked on her until he got her to, to, believe. to believe. Yes. Her mistake was listening. Her mistake was, you know, not, not closing it off and saying, I'm not even going to listen to this. I know God knows what's best. She had no reason to doubt God's work, but he manipulated, he deceived, he got her to, and then she took to him. And Satan could have even said to her, look, I'm touching it, I'm not dying. You know, I'm okay, you'll be okay. You're going to be, you're going to, it's going to be even better because you'll be like God. You'll know what you don't know now. So he enticed and then she took to Adam, who had to have seen a change in her because we believe that change takes place immediately. So Adam, open eyed, knew this is wrong. This is what we were told not to do, but he chose to go ahead and eat it also. Mm -hmm. Why? Everybody will read into that. Some will say, well, he decided if, if Eve's going to fall, I'm going to fall with her. And I don't, I don't see it that way. I see it as a personal decision. He saw was enticed also. She hasn't died, and, and wow, you know, there's something different here. He, he accepted it uh, wide-eyed open. Because of that, God came against him even harsher than against her because she was deceived. He openly, willfully chose to. But Satan knew how. I mean, how did it come into his heart to want to be in God's place? How can, how can you be in a, a perfect love <laughs> and have everything, there's nothing you're lacking, and not be satisfied? Want that worship, want that number one place. And didn't even want to share it with God, didn't want to be a co-equal with God. He wanted to be God. How did that happen? I don't know. But he uses that same pride to get at man. You'll be like God. You'll know like God knows. So he, he knew how to entice him because God made Adam and Eve with the um, freedom to choose. 
He didn't make them puppets. He didn't say, this is all you can do. He didn't make them a robot. You'll, you'll do exactly what I program you. He didn't want that. He wanted man to want him, to come with a heart to him. So he gave man the ability to choose or reject. And man made the same mistake as Satan. But again, Satan in God's presence doesn't get a chance of redemption. Man, I think because he lived a separate from God and because of knowing how Satan came in and usurped, God had more grace, mercy, and made the way of, of redemption so that man could be brought back into God's very presence. Does that answer it? Mm -hmm. Because if you notice, he, uh, he never tried to attack Adam at all until she was in the picture. He knew to get to Adam through her, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe because Adam's eyes were for her. You know, God's got to be first, number one. Mm -hmm. As husband and wife, we love our mate, but God has to be number one. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of food for thought in there, a lot of room to think for yourselves and I can't say right and wrong because we're only given an outline mm -hmm. but we can ask one day if it matters <laughs> mm -hmm. do we know necessarily that the serpent didn't approach Adam first <clears throat> we don't have it recorded so I would say it probably did not happen mm -hmm. out of an argument of silence but we do know we only have an outline so you know maybe I, you he know, just knew that Adam was stronger well, he walked with God, so that made him stronger. But but when she got in the picture, he's yeah. Because again, you can't <laughs> you can't go to weakness that we know weakness mm -hmm. according to sin. Weakness is different, you know. That's why she was deceived. But it's not that she couldn't step up to the plate. She could. She had the same ability to say no to Satan that that Adam had. So. Um, the reason why I hesitate to say that did happen is because there's so much out there, even in the rabbinical literature, which is man's interpretation on the scriptures, that wants to read so much into this. We'll talk about Adam having a first wife, Lilith by name. If you get into any of that, you're into what comes out of the pit of hell. You're, you're, you're not staying to the scriptures. So uh, nothing happened that we need to know about except what's given to us in Scripture. I'll put it that way. So whether Satan worked on Adam and couldn't get him doesn't matter. What matters is he worked he on Eve. He got her. Eve took it to Adam. Adam willfully joined her. I think but, Eve was just idle. She didn't have a kitchen to run. She didn't have a house to run. There was speech all over. <laughs> she was idle. That's why the devil had a chance to talk to her. Adam was busy naming all the animals. She could have Good, point. <laughs> Good point. If you're not here, Rowena, she says she thinks that Eve, it was because she was idle. She didn't have a house to clean. She didn't have meals to cook. <laughs> the idle hands are the devil's work. That's where we laugh. But, but yes, there is, there is, and I She's even brought that all. out. We, are, we all have, has men and women. We all have different personalities, so there was a reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she said to all. Yeah, so anyway, regardless of all of this, and it's, it's interesting to think, and I don't stop you from thinking, keep thinking. I want you to, to keep thinking. But uh, we definitely see a reluctance to leave and an understanding of that completely. Um, just picking back up to move on because we need to. So he drove them out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherry beam and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. We get our whole reason here, but let me break it down. Let me unpack. Let's go back to the fact that it says um, from the east. He drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherry beam. So the entrance of the Garden of Eden, we see from the east. Why is that interesting? Look where the Lord comes from when he mm -hmm. returns. Matthew 24. Whoops. Matthew 24. <clears throat> excuse me. And we'll look at verse 27. Oh, Matthew. Yeah. We were in that. Okay. okay. Matthew 24 and verse 27. And Matthew 24, I encourage you, read it from the start. <clears throat> excuse me for the frog today. <clears throat> verse 2 tells us that. <clears throat> 
so sorry. <clears throat> Let me try some water. Okay, that Yeshua is talking with his Talmudim, his disciples, his followers. They're asking him a very, very important question with a Jewish mind. Okay? Matthew's written, he's a Jew, he's writing about the Jewish people, he's presenting the king of the Jews in his gospel. His whole intent here is to answer this Jewish question asked in verse 2. Well, let, let me back it up, and I'm not going to go through the whole chapter, but I just want you always to keep it in your mind because this chapter is so taken out of context so many times. Good intentions, but leave it in context. If you want to apply, you can apply, but leave it in context also. Yeshua Jesus came out of the temple, was going away when his Talmudim, his disciples, came up to him to point out the temple buildings to him, and he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. <coughs> the temple is the place where they meet God. Remember, they don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within. This is their place of meeting God. Everything revolves around their temple life. Their feasts, their holy days, everything revolves around the temple. And Yeshua has just told them this is going to be destroyed. Hello, that's not good news to the Jew. That's pretty disturbing. That's their whole life point. You know, this is what matters to them. So he goes and he sits on the Mount of Olives, which is very close by there, and his Talmudim come to him privately, not doing it around the crowds. Hey, Lord, I need some one-on-one -on -one time with you. This is what you should do anytime you have a question. Get privately with the Lord. Get into the Word of God with the Lord and let Him speak to you. And they asked him specifically, tell us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming? Because he keeps telling them he's going to be coming. And then here's your Jewish phrase. And at the end of the age. What's the sign of the end of the age? Well, what end of the age are they talking about? The end of their lives? No. The end of the life of this temple? Whoa. They're thinking with Jewish minds. They have told them all the way back from Moshe and before, through all of the prophets, that there is coming what we call the millennial age. There's coming this time when their Messiah is going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem, rule the world, the Israel nation will be the head nation, taking the word of God to the others, representing God to the others as they were supposed to do all along, but this and all the promises that go with it, the land that will be Israel's, their God sitting on the throne, them coming up to worship their God, this is what they're looking for. They're not looking for the rapture. They know nothing of a rapture. That's not been promised to them. That's promised to the church age. The church hasn't even started yet. They aren't existing yet, okay? They don't exist until after Yeshua's death, burial, resurrection, ascension to heaven, and the Holy Spirit is sent down. Once the Holy Spirit is sent down, I'm going to baptize myself if I leave that there, not with the Holy Spirit, but with water. But once the Holy Spirit is sent down, that's the beginning of what we call the church, the called out assembly. God's working in a new way, and, and this church age is not promised a physical land. We're promised a spiritual home. Where's your citizenship? In heaven. Thank you. In heaven. Our citizenship is not on this earth. Mm -hmm. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we are going, and we know it. That's our eternal home. Will we come out of heaven? Yes. We'll come back with the Lord. We'll rule and reign on this earth mm -hmm. with the Lord. But we will not be bound to a specific. You're not going to live like you're living now in San Bernardino, California, or Highland, or, or Riverside, or Redlands, or Norco, or wherever you are. Your heavenly home will be heaven. Okay. That's your address. Okay, and then you go out on assignment and you come back. But the Jewish nation, mm -hmm. the people as a whole, the nation of Israel, they were promised way back with Abraham, then with Yitzhak, Isaac, mm -hmm. then with Yaakov, Jacob, this land I give to you and your descendants. For how long? Forever. Forever. <laughs> I love the word. If forever doesn't mean forever, throw your Bible out because either every word means what it says or we're in trouble. So Israel is being promised this kingdom age when their Messiah is going to rule. 
He's not going to suffer and die. They're going to be thrown for a loop very shortly after this time because they're going to watch their one that they thought was going to set up the kingdom be crucified and die. You wonder what Thomas was doing that weekend when the others were all together in the upper room? He is out there trying to find his head. He was spinning around inside of his head. Poor guy. Watch the one he loved and the one he thought was going to be his Messiah, his Savior, crucified. And he didn't have the privilege of going home and opening up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and reading the rest yeah. of the story. You know, he spent that weekend in confusion. The, the ones that had gathered together in the upper room were also trying to figure it all out. They, they were, their boat was rocking. God doesn't leave them there, but they're not fully understanding yet. We have that great privilege of looking back. But they were looking for that promise that the people of Israel have been given from the beginning. Yes, you're going to be kicked out of your land because of disobedience. You're going to go into exile, and it happened. Assyria got the ten northern tribes. Babylon got the two southern tribes. Babylon swallows up Assyria. Now Babylon has all the twelve tribes. The Babylonian captivity. We have Daniel and all of that during that time. You can, we saw them down in Egypt prior to that, crying out for the Messiah to bring them back into the land. A Messiah, not the Messiah, brings them back into the land. And when they stay in obedience to their God, they stay in their land. When they're disobedient, they're kicked out. We go to the diaspora. That's 70 AD. The temple that Yeshua said, this temple is going to be destroyed, it happened in 70 AD. At that time, Rome's taking over. Rome's been in control. That's why when they wanted to, to kill Yeshua Jesus, the, the Jewish leaders that were against him, they would have taken him outside the city and stoned him. They couldn't even do that because Rome had the rule. They had to go to Rome, go to Pilate. They had to get it accepted for him to be put to death and notice it's by Roman ways, the crucifixion. All part of God's perfect plan. But Israel was not in control of her land at this point, and it only gets worse. 70 AD, the temple is destroyed by 100 AD, probably the majority of Jews are dead if they're in Israel in 70 AD. By 100 AD, I don't think you're going to find a live Jew in Israel. By 132 AD, with the last revolt called the Bar Kokhba revolt, almost, the Jews are almost annihilated. And they are scattered far. They have been scattered ever since. The coming back that God has promised would always be there because of God being faithful. Because God said, I will keep my word. I promised you to be a people, I promised to be your God, and I promised to give you this land. I will keep my word. We see that start up again, not in its totality, but the initiation in what year? When did they go back? 1948, oh. when Israel became a nation again. A nation reborn in a day, as Isaiah 66 <coughs> says, the nation would be reborn in a day. That's the start. That's when God's prophetic clock went Tick-tock, tick-tock. It had been on pause. Now it's on tick-tock. And it will continue until we see the Lord return, the battle stop, him set up his kingdom, Israel raised up, and the nations come in, just as God said, with Israel living in all her land. So, hello, Iran. Hello, Iraq. Hello, Syria. Hello, Lebanon. <laughs> Not all of, of, of Iran, which of them one is further out, but all of these and more down toward into Egypt, the, the Sinai How about in Desert, the Jordan? all of that. Remember to try to stay Jordan. behind Jordan? Yes. What is, so that, is that Israel land too? It is Israel land too because they didn't cross over into the land that was promised to them. Mm -hmm. So yes, Jordan also is part of, if you want the parameters, read Genesis 15 ahead of time. We'll get there. The and Genesis won't it 15, become 18. even bigger because... Or God will like separate the mountains and create yes. a big valley. Yes, when you're talking about him coming down and putting his feet on the Mount of Olives uh, and it cleaving in two, the great valley, the mountains move to the north and to the south. Yes, that is uh, making it enlarging it because the temple, the site that we have seen that's the temple area today, mm -hmm. can you imagine all the nations of the world trying to get through that little oh, yeah. temple? There's no way. But the size that we read about, Ezekiel 40 through 48, I'm talking chapters, not verses, 
that tells us how large it is. And it is bigger and better than anything that they've ever had. Before it will be temples one and two, already here and already destroyed. Temple three, rebuilt either before or during the tribulation. I tend to think during, but it could happen before. Destroyed when the abomination desolation set up in the middle. And then uh, the millennial temple is the fourth temple. There's no reason mm -hmm. to worry about, well, there can't be a fourth temple. Why not? Do you read anywhere in scripture where it says there can't be? Because I don't. Which is the one that they're getting ready now? They, they, the third. third. That will be destroyed. Because they already got stuff going on, don't they? Yes, Safety. you saw all that stuff. That's ready to go one. into actual... I did see it. Yes, the Temple Temporal Treasure Institution. Institute. And they got a, they I'll got show a you pictures and you'll too, remember. That they have yeah. found three that are, yeah. are bred. They're, they're watching them. And believe me, if God's done everything else, there'll be a red heifer when there has to be. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we are that close. It could be one of those, but they're watching them right now. The covenant of land is Genesis 15, 18. To your descendants, I've given this land from the river of Egypt, that's the Nile River, as far as the great river, the river, the river Euphrates, that's in Iraq. Um, and then there are other places that we get more scripture, but from at least the Nile to the Euphrates, right here what in Genesis 15. 15. Genesis 15, verse 18. If we stay on track now and get through 4 and chapter 5 and chapter 6, we'll get there one day. Now, we may have to study it up there together because we may get raptured first. But. Well, I, uh, just, then just walk to it. I think that's what everybody's saying. Right, right. Okay, but let's go back now, back to Matthew 24. And I don't mean to get off track with you, but this is so important. Matthew 24, and I lost it. Um, in that beginning, what the, the Talmudim are asking here, let me just call it back up, is when is that going to be, that end of the age, the millennial age, that we have been promised as a nation to receive those earthly blessings? And I stress that because the, the people called the church, the called out assembly, we have been given spiritual promises. We've been promised our home in heaven. We've been promised to rule and reign with the Lord. We, we're not given a plot of land until this land on this earth is yours, which we do see very clearly God did with Israel. So it's two totally different things. And if you read in Matthew 24, yourself there, and you put the church there, and you talk about the end of the age, well, the end of the church age is rapture anyway. It's not mm -hmm. even you know, what's going to come, but then you'd have to believe that all these things that are listed here would have to be before the rapture. All the things that are going to be listed now, because they want to know, what's the signs of all this coming? Well, read verses 3 on. Here's all the signs of what will come mm -hmm. as this time approaches. Now, this is for the Jewish mindset, though. Yes, because it's a okay. Jewish book written to a Jewish audience about the Jewish timeline that God gave the Jewish people. How much more Jewish can it get? Do you know that was our lesson in BSF today? What is it? The science of the end. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. So we're in the 24th chapter. She paying attention. Well, sometimes it helps to hear it from different angles and a second time and a third time. But it shows we're on that same page and we're putting it together. So when he starts telling them, he tells them there's going to be many who will tell you I'm Christ. Don't believe them. Don't, don't go out and follow them. You get down to verse 15, and he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, abomination in other scripture, because I'm this isn't my point for today, so I'm just summarizing and not going, you know, having us look up all the scriptures, but look it up. Abomination is idolatry. When you see an idol that's going to make something desolate, what's it going to make desolate? It's going to make the holy place desolate, because mm -hmm. our, our verse here, 15, tells us. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of through Daniel, the prophet. Okay, right there. Was it spoken to the church? No, yeah. it was spoken to yeah. Daniel. Daniel wrote to the Jewish people. There was no church. You're now back in 6th century B.C. There's no church until, let's just round it off and say 40 A.D. I don't mean exactly 40, but, you know, in, in the 30s getting toward 40 A.D. Okay, so... Daniel spoke about this. He said, in the holy place. Where's the holy place? In your church? No, no, in the temple. In, 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 in the uh, temple. Utah? <laughs> Sorry, no. folks. Okay, I'll yes, behave. Sir. Okay, the holy place <laughs> is Robbie in the temple. <laughs> it's in the temple, which is the permanent 
the tabernacle was a picture of. When you look at the tabernacle, you easily see the holy place had the holy of holies in it, okay? We have that section of the tabernacle, that little building where God's presence dwelt in the midst of the cherry beam. Hold on to that thought because believe it or not, we'll go back to the cherry beam with that thought in Genesis in just a couple of minutes, okay? So the temple now has the holy place. Only the priest would go in with the sacrifice on the mercy, put the blood on the mercy seat once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So would, Daniel's people knew where he was talking about. Jewish people today know where he's talking about. Mm -hmm. If you ask a religious Jew today, why don't you do the sacrifice? Their answer will be, we don't have the temple. We can't. There isn't an altar, a place to make the sacrifice and to put the blood. So obviously by this point in the tribulation, because Matthew 24 has given us tribulation signs, the coming that just pre the things that come that just precedes the second coming of the Lord. There's your temple. The idols put in the, the holy place. We know that the Antichrist is going to put in image for himself to be worshipped. Say, you come in here and you bow down and you worship me. The religious Jews are going to say, are you nuts? Mm -hmm. We don't worship anyone but the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. And they will flee from the temple. The religious ones who have learned to look to the scriptures, and I'm talking about those who have come to faith, those who keep the testimony of Yeshua, which is the fulfillment of prophecy, it's the spirit of prophecy, they will know because God tells them when, when you see this, then those who are in Judea, notice it's a specific location. We're still mm -hmm. talking Jewish. They didn't say those who are in San Bernardino, it's those who are in Judea. Flee to flee. the mountains, okay? So this is the time that they're to flee. They're not even, if they're on the rooftop, don't even go in your house. Don't pack a bag, get out. Because everything's going to be shut down and you are going to be caught where you are if you don't get out now. And so he goes through and he tells them, pray it's not like this and not like that because you got to get out. you got to go, 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 okay? Then we continue down and we have... Uh, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now, he describes them. Those days of the sun darkening, the moon not giving its light, the stars falling from the sky, the powers of heavens be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Remember the question? When's the Son of Man coming? When's, when's Messiah going to come as Son of Man setting up his kingdom? This is when he will appear. Mm -hmm. And all the tribes of the earth, and sorry, Indian tribes, but it's not speaking to you, it's speaking to the Jewish tribes. Then they will mourn. They'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. They'll see, okay? When the rapture occurs, they're not seeing. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to wonder where we disappear to mm -hmm. also. But they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, in the clouds, on the clouds, of the sky with power and great glory. And then he says that he gathers them from the four winds. He brings them from the four corners of the earth. He brings them into the land of Israel. This is when he has now split the Mount of Olives. We have Ezekiel 40 through 48, the building of the temple. We have the millennial reign start from there. So if you keep Matthew in order, you see when these things are going to be happening in order. God's got an order. He gave us a very orderly outline here. So when I go back up to verse 27, which was my whole point in, in taking you to Matthew 24, we read, and, and notice, okay, um, oh, yeah. you've got the abomination, desolation, and I think just about everybody agrees that that's at the midpoint of the tribulation, which is a seven-year period. So that's happening in verse 15. Verse 27 is down from 15, and it's... It's before the end of all of these signs that we get in 29. You have, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So when all these days are being summed up and come up and we're coming to the end, and we are told in another scripture that God cuts those days short for the sake of the elect. There'd be no one left alive if he didn't cut them short. So it's not exactly seven years to the day. They're cut short by some sort of margin here when the Lord returns in his second coming to set up his kingdom, answering this, fulfilling this. And where does he come from? He comes from the east. 
So very interesting, it was the east that they're being sent out, but it's the east where the Lord will return. Okay, let me show you also, on our way back to uh, Genesis, go to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah? Yes. Oh, that's when we did. Zechariah 14. chapter 14. You did that one today too? I thought we well, did. You probably did because these tie together. If you were, you know, so I imagine you were in that study. Okay, no, verse 4 says, In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Now we were just reading, he's coming, he's coming from the east, but his coming is so magnificent. He is so who he is, his glory, that is seen from the east to the west. But where is he coming? It makes it very clear. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Where was he talking to his Talmudim? On the Mount of Olives. Where was the temple? Right Mount near there, in Jerusalem. Mount of Olives is part of Jerusalem. Okay, so, in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. Rochelle, just read the scripture and let it speak. <laughs> it spells it out very clearly for you. And the Mount of Olives... Zechariah 14, 4. Okay, thank you. Okay, so his feet stand on the Mount of Olives in the front of Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. So he's just splitting it open north to south. He's coming from the east to the west. You've got a huge area here now because it's going to have to be for Israel to live in this land and for the nations to come up to worship the Lord at his holy temple in fulfillment of everything God had said. So very interesting that is on the east, almost as if it's looking. Remember when the Holy Spirit left um, or the Shekinah glory, let me put it that way to not confuse any of you. When the Shekinah glory left the temple, it hovered. It moved to the doorway, then it moved up to the mountain. There was something between us. There's three times it moved, almost as if it didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, turn, turn, turn to God so that, that I don't have to leave you. It's, it, I, I almost just feel his heart just breaking as he had to move, and he had to move, and he had to move. And here I almost see that same thing. I have to kick you out of that garden that I wanted you to have all this glory. But by way of the east, I'm going to come back. There will be the day that this will be established again. I just, I think it's sweet in that I see yeah. his love there. Wasn't that the reason why they planted a cemetery right there by the eastern gate? The Muslims have The Muslims that. did. The Muslims, the Muslims have heard cemetery. that the Jewish Messiah is supposed to come to the Mount of Olives. A Jewish person cannot go through a grave uh, cemetery without <clears throat> becoming contaminated. So it would contaminate the Messiah to come through the graves. So they put up the graves so that he couldn't come from the east. And they did it right in front of the eastern mm -hmm. gate that is blocked up. And scripture said it would be blocked up until the glory of the Lord would come through it again. You think he's going to have any problem with those graves in the front? No. <laughs> he's going to blast through. He's going to blast that cemented up gate open. His glory is going to come through and nothing will contaminate our God. I was really surprised. I didn't know that, but I was really surprised that they had that nerve to get that close, to build a set, to build their, their grave. They don't respect God. The, Allah is their God, and they have, are expecting their imam to come, which will set them up for a world role and will get rid of all of the infidel. Well, why didn't somebody, yes, you know, why didn't their uh, prime minister stop them? Probably because at the time the Muslim control was there. Even in 1948, when Israel is back in the land, actually, I'm sorry, let me take you, yeah, yeah, 48, okay. Um, no, 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 67, I'm, I'm, I'm spinning my wheels. I'm talking about the time when Moshe Dayan said, 67. It is 67, because it's the reunification of Jerusalem. Until 1967, from 48 to 67, the Jewish people were limited where they could go in Israel. They didn't have the freedom they have today. Jerusalem was a divided city at that point. Now, mind you, David made Jerusalem the capital B.C., 1000 B.C., something like that, okay? So we're, we're now into 3,000 years that Jerusalem has been declared the capital of Israel. 
and it's never been an, an Arab country's capital. It's always been the capital of Israel. But, uh, and I forgot where I was going. Oh, okay, so in 1948, they've got the way back into the land, but they couldn't even go to the Western Wall, then called the Wailing Wall, which is the retaining wall around the temple. It wasn't the actual temple wall. It's the wall around the Temple Mount area. But it still was very, very sacred to the Jew, and to this day it is. I cannot go to that wall without becoming an emotional basket case because to me that wall still standing is representative of my God saying, I will never let there be an end of the Jewish people. So for me it is a faith-moving moment that I just feel the presence of the Lord like, I can't explain, and I'm doing real good not to fall apart while I'm saying it to you because usually I get extremely emotional. In, until 1967, they couldn't even have access to it. It was a very small plaza. It wasn't wide like now because they've, they've made more room. But in 1967, when Israel got back complete control of Jerusalem, what they fight over to this day, that rightfully belongs to Israel, Moshe Dayan, one of the head generals then, said, look, we are trying to show, and, and they even told the Arabs that were living in that area, you don't have to flee. We're getting back control of the city, but we will <clears throat> live side by side with you, as they do with Israeli Arabs to this day. There are those who have, have long-time roots in the land also and live peaceably with Israeli Jews in the land. But Moshe Dayan said, you've got two places up there that are sacred to you, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Dome of the Rock, the big gold one that, that you see. Mm -hmm. Some of you can't see that, but some of you can. And then there's the, the smaller one. It has a silver dome, and, and the name's escaping me. But these are two sacred places in Islam. In Maybe I shouldn't say Islam, but to the Muslim. I'll put it that way, to the Muslim. The Jewish people, knowing what it's like to not be allowed freedom of religion, have always said, we'll give a people their freedom to to worship however they feel is best. So Moshe Dayan said, we'll leave the Temple Mount in Arab control so that they can worship as they see as best. Now, have they returned that favor? No. When they've been in control of Jewish sites, they've destroyed them. But there's a huge argument today because a Jew should be able to go anywhere in the land of Israel as a Jew. They go up on the Temple Mount, they can't wear their kippah. There's a big fight that you'll hear go on because they're allowing the Arabs control up there and the Arabs are calling the shots. That's the area that I told you in my prayer time before that during the month of Ramadan usually gets cut off from 40 and under male Arabs going up because they go up, listen to the prayers out of the minarets that are hollering at them, kill, kill, kill. You know, go after, to kill the infidel, which is the Jew, which is the Christian, and it's inciting them. It's like a pep rally. And you hear that day after day after day after day, and, and you're <coughs> so indoctrinated, what are you going to do? You're going to go out and you're going to kill. So Israel stops those who are the most likely to carry it out from even going up and hearing, because they do have ultimate control over the land. But they give the freedom of... Um, religious control to the, the Muslims up on top. Why would they do that? Because they thought it would make peace. Mm -hmm. And that would be why they'd let them have a Muslim cemetery. You need a place to bury your dead. Bury your dead. You've got your own land. Go over there. Yeah. Apparently if the you, Muslims haven't read the final chapter. No. <laughs> and their Quran, which they do read, does not give the same final. It is in the Quran. But we know that the Quran is not true. We know that it is not um, inspired by God and it is not without its errors and all the rest. And we know that it twists and, you know, it's not on that level. But it, I love your pro-Israel spirit, <laughs> but Israel will go to a great length to try to make peace with her neighbors. They even make and God angry, don't they? At they do times that. they do. At times they do. Because the Gaza Strip, they gave that up. That was, got, that was their land. Yes, and even more. And it's not bought them a moment of peace. Because unfortunately, those in control, and I'm not talking about Arabs in, as a people. There are Arab people who want to live in peace with Jewish people. But the leaders that are in control don't want P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace with Israel. 
They want the P-I-E-C-E. -E. They want the peace called Israel. Mm -hmm. They want to push okay. the Jew off into the Mediterranean Sea, wipe them off the face of the map. Look at their maps. Their mm -hmm. maps call it Palestine. They don't acknowledge Israel. Mm -hmm. They teach it to their, their little ones before they even are of school age that they're in your land and we're here to annihilate them and then it'll be our land. So, no, they're not going to, you know, but Israel keeps putting out that olive branch trying to to buy peace. So when is God going to step in on that and, and make them? At least seven years from now. <laughs> <laughs> she asked me, when's God going to step in on that and do what he's saying? We, we will see we'll him allow the judgment of the tribulation, which is on the entire world. But the wrath of God falls because the cup of sin has come to his fullness. And God will pour out his wrath, allow that judgment to fall. And at the end of that judgment, that is only fair and right and just that it is poured out on sin and on evil. And then God brings that to a stop and says, enough is enough. In fact, if he didn't stop it then, there wouldn't be an Israel to come back to. There wouldn't be a Jewish uh, well, the Jewish believer to come back to because it's so bad by that point there wouldn't be human flesh to come back to if God didn't stop it. That's when he'll stop, step in in his entirety. His hand will be seen all the way through it just as we see his hand in the Holocaust and other times. He was there. He brought our people through. Israel was birthed out of the ashes of the Holocaust. Horrible way to have your birth but that is what brought Israel back into the world saying, you know what? The Jews have a right to have a place to live and call their own. It came out of the ashes of the Holocaust. Through the tribulation, God keeps his hand on those. He does allow a huge number to be martyred. These are believers. I believe that they will be Jewish and Gentile believers that are martyred for their faith. Mm -hmm. But all that man can do is take this body from them. He can't take their eternal status. He can't take, where do we find them martyred? We find them under the throne. Can you imagine, you're looking up and it's just all the Lord, just his glory and you're under his glory. They're still aware and crying out for their blood to be uh, avenged and rightfully so. And, and the Lord says, just wait till your number's full. As soon as your number's full, yeah, I'll avenge. And he does. But he's long suffering. He is patient. He is waiting for more to get saved now, even for the church age to end. And he will be working in those days of tribulation to bring many hearts to him. Because unfortunately, many will not listen and will not look until they're in dire straits. And then there will be those who will get saved. God raises up 144,000 Jewish people, gets those people saved, seals them by the Spirit of God so that they can't be harmed until their work is done. And their work is to carry the gospel out to the ends of the earth. So that the Jews that are in exile, the Jews that are in diaspora, will be reached with the gospel message. But guess what? That brings in a whole flood of Gentiles that get to hear it too. And get to have that chance to be saved also. Because God loves the dear Gentile too. Mm -hmm. so. Amen. So, Rochelle, yes. during the time that the Lord said, flee, when you see the abomination of the they will flee because they're already reading scriptures. Yes, yes. The ones who will flee are the ones who are reading the scriptures. So I believe the ones who flee are believers. Mm -hmm. You know, there may be a few that will be caught up in it and to hopefully get saved as they go mm -hmm. along. But the majority, the ones that are going to know to, that are going to know, I'm on my, my rooftop and I heard what just happened. I know I don't go in and pack a bag. I know what the scripture said. I know it said, get out now. And, and, They'll be obedient to it, and it'll spare them. Because I do believe God does take them down into the mountains of Petra, right on the other side in Jordanian territory today. I do believe it is a place prepared by God. I do believe that he's going to put his protective hand over it. We even read a scripture where it says that the Antichrist is going after them with a vengeance. We read that in Revelation 12. But he names the area of Moab and Edom that escaped from his hand. I believe it's because God's put his hand right over that area. Mm -hmm. so and he's protecting them. <coughs> in in the Jordanian Jordan. mountain areas. In specifically, I'm talking about Petra. Amman is the capital. It's not far from Amman. We, we um, landed in... in um, okay, how do I shorten it? Let me just put it this way. We stayed in Amman, and we traveled by bus a distance, and then we traveled by horse... 
horseback the rest of the way into Petra because the way in is single file, only one horse at a time can get through Beautiful. the opening called the Seek. Yes, and you come into a rose red, gorgeous, take your breath away city. And it has these huge, huge caves where many people could live. And they look at them and they say, yeah, but how will they survive? It's a desert. Well, hello. Do so you think they got to kill two and a half million people mm -hmm. plus yeah. in, in, in the lap of luxury and paradise? Weren't they in the wilderness? Weren't they in the yeah, desert? Did he years. not have to bring water out of a rock? Mm -hmm. And if you're watering two and a half million people, we're not talking a, a glass for Rochelle, a class. We're talking mm -hmm. enough water to cook, to drink, to clean themselves, to do what they're supposed to be doing. That's a lot of water that came out of that rock that continued as the rock followed them. Where they needed it, it was provided. How did they eat? Did they go fishing in the in the sea? <laughs> what sea? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but God every day fed them mon. You call it mana. Mm -hmm. But every day it came down and he fed them. Why can't he do that again? Mm -hmm. And they've got the cisterns, the the whole um, aqueduct system, because this was Nabataean area until the Nabataean trade routes changed and it became like a ghost town. They were, because every bit of water was precious, flash floods would come into the area. They knew how to send it down those aqueducts and into the cisterns and store the water. That could be restored so easily. It's we still saw there. The acts and aqueducts. Yes, we did. That were ancient, that were used in Israel, the same way there, there are in Petra. And I've seen them in Petra. They're there. They exist. There's no problem. That thing's so too hard for uh, uh, Jerusalem, will they be able to get there without being murdered? But as if they traveling? get out quickly, <clears throat> if they go quickly, if they don't mm -hmm. take time, because they're going to need the fastest ways to go. The, there has even been a small airport where maybe there will be some planes that will even go, but the majority probably will go foot, car, truck, you know, van, whatever, you know, fed. Well, they so they'll go, go down the King's there? Highway. There's, there's a main... Well, yeah. they, well, they just simply go there? I mean, like, God I, will tell them... I, go? God will put it in their hearts, but mm -hmm. I think from their study of Scripture, they will also know, and I think that there will be those who have scouted out and said, when this gets worse here, here's the King's Highway, here's the way to go, and then it's very easy, you know, to, to follow it and to know. But I think God will put it in their hearts to know mm -hmm. the, the way to go. I think they will fly because in Revelation they said two wings of a great eagle were could given be. to the woman yes. so that she could fly into the wilderness. And if it is meant in literally flying, then yes, there will be airlift that will happen for a very short time. How many flights would get out? Not long, not many. And when it says pray that your flight's not on the, in the winter, because there could be snow on the roads. That's going to slow it down, make it harder. Pray that it's not on Shabbat. Why would it matter if it's on Shabbat? Because <coughs> transportation be. closes oh. down. The railway in Jerusalem isn't going to be going. Will they stone you know, them if um, you start moving on a Shabbat? Uh, if you're in an Orthodox area, the Orthodox yeah. would stone you. But but it's just that the mode of transportation won't be there. Mm -hmm. When I was in Israel in 82, we got an extra night in Israel because uh, they went on <laughs> strike. They all went on strike. And that was who our tickets were with. So we got an extra night because nobody could fly out. That's what I'm saying. Until it gets grounded, the flights could go quickly, cars will go quickly, taxis will go quickly, you know, whatever way they're, they're going. And if you know this is coming, you're going to be prepared. Yeah. If you're smart and you've got a car, you're going to have gas in that tank waiting for this because it's going to be obvious it's coming up to that day, mm -hmm. you know know exactly when but yeah. you'll see the hints coming yeah. and you'll know because they have been reading the scriptures and so they will know yeah because the temple is already there at that yes time. yes and then christ taking over more and more and showing who he's mm -hmm. like and the, the mark that will come out at the same time that you have to have his mark so you know they're going to know and understand more than we do looking at it and wondering how these things are going to happen they're going to be living through it um, but there'll be those who are the scholars in the scriptures who will have been studying who will be teaching the people and and as it gets tougher, you know, they're going to know we're being hunted down. It's not going to be long before we are cut off. You're so. really, in a way, already hunted down. It, it started. Yes. It has started, yes. Yeah, and woe to the woman who's nursing because 
you can't run fast with a baby that you're nursing. You know, that's why all of these scriptures are going to be very meaningful to them. But let them know you've got to do something rapidly because the, the Antichrist at first is going to go after them. But then I believe another reason why they'll survive down there. Now, it could go one of two ways. That seek, that entrance is so narrow. It could be after the people get in that God wants that he brings an earthquake and it closes it off. Oh, or it right. could even just be that the Antichrist is going to think, They'll die down there. Yeah. You know, that's it. No there's, food, there's, no they're fools. They've gone into a trap. I don't need to spend my time and energy. I'll save my bullets. I'll go back after these. And he does. So, yes. Well, what about the rest of the world? I mean, they talk about just Israel, but what about the rest of them? The rest of the world okay. needs to be prepared to survive without taking that mark. If, if we're talking those who are believers, mm -hmm. they're going to have to have enough supplies that they won't need to buy, you know, because they won't be able to. Mm -hmm. But it's not like the Antichrist is going to come to San Bernardino, California, and come to Jesse Street and hunt down whoever's here in this house then. There will be the long arm of the law. There will be those who will hunt them down, yes. Mm -hmm. But any, any the others, if they feel the need because they're in an area that's likely to be, um, what's the word, when we're being... Um, massacred, there's another word though. Um, ah. They persecuted. But... Persecuted. Oh, persecuted, that's exactly, thank you, the word I wanted. When they're being persecuted, there may be those that, no, it's pretty hot here, it's, it's going to be pretty bad here, it's obvious where we are, and they may go scout the mountains around here and find a place to go, you know, where they can take their supplies, because they know, okay, it's going to be three and a half years from when this happens, they may even go ahead. You know, let's take a four-year supply. Let's get out of Dodge before we hear that it's happened. You know, um, God, God will be working miracles and, and protecting. But again, many, many, many will lose their lives. Many aren't going to be able to flee. And many aren't going to get out in time. And they will lose their lives because the number of martyred is more than can be numbered. And people are going to take the mark. The people who take the mark are not believers. No, but there are there is a lot that will be doing that because and the internet doesn't help it. No, and if they take the mark, God says it's it's done. They pledged their allegiance yes. to the Antichrist. In essence, they pledged their allegiance to Satan, and their end will will suffer the consequences of that decision. So, not something light. And they, I heard then neighbors will turn neighbors in. Fathers against children, everything. We saw that in the Holocaust. The Holocaust was oh, a did. small picture. Yeah, because there are times when you're starving and so scared and, and want to survive so bad that you're willing to turn in your own. And there were those who did, sadly. Wow. There were those and the did. Jewish people are kind of like stubborn. Even, <laughs> you know, even in the kind first, uh, what do you call that? When they were taken away by mm -hmm. the Babylon, mm -hmm. God said, go and establish yourself in the land. But some would like, hang back and, yeah. and and fight and fight mm -hmm. so they eventually yeah. lost their lives and remember jeremiah that's why they came against him is because he kept telling them it's not going to go well for you the false prophets kept saying oh everything will be okay but jeremiah yeah. kept saying it's not going to and you need to prepare for this and you need to go with this yeah. because this is what god has said so probably the false so. prophets too will be telling them stay let's fight them Right, mm -hmm. right. And the false you know, this, antichrist, yes. There's the stubbornness has been a positive in in making it in keeping them alive. It's it's a good and a bad, just like you see in any person today. If you have a stubborn streak, it can be for your good and it can be for your demise. Mm -hmm. Yes. It makes them strong. Yes. <laughs> but really the only ones that are going to look for the right answer are gonna be the believers that get into the word of God and, and God will be directing them. We got way off, no, but I think not. it's important. <coughs> I very think, you current, know, I guess. We're it is current. current. It is current. <laughs> you know, and it doesn't matter if we don't get through the end of Genesis. You know, we're not here to push it. But God, every detail, God plans it so specifically. That's why if he tells us that he sent them out on the east, let's look at why he says that, because there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. And even though it's 328, I want to tie it up. Mm -hmm. Let me bring to you, just to end on this note also, um, in Genesis 3, you don't have to go back there because I'm going to stop you somewhere else if you don't have your finger in there. But he drove them out at the east of the Garden of Eden. He stationed the cherubim. I want to, at least to start into it. I know we won't get into it fully. Let me lay the groundwork for it and then we'll come back <coughs> and we'll look a little more specifically next week. But I love the cherubim. 
The cherubim are, it, it's plural, cherub is singular, and as soon as I say oh. cherub, you all picture cute little baby cherub, angels, cherub, 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 yes, little sweet faces, no black eyes, <laughs> 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 so obviously I don't mean me, <laughs> but throw that out. If you want a description of what the cherry beam look like, go and read it on your own. This is your homework. Ezekiel, 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 chapter 1, verses 4 to 28. And also chapter 10, verses 1 to 22. Any of you who have my cross-references, it's on there. Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel 1, verses 4 through 28. Okay. And Ezekiel 10, oh, verses 1 to 22. Okay. okay? okay. I'm going to go to 10, 20 just for a quick moment because, again, I'm only summarizing. And I won't read all those scriptures next week. I'll just pull out a few of the verses. That's why if you have it in your mind, you'll be... You know, you have a good foundation for where we'll start next week. But Ezekiel 10, verse 20. I told you to read through 22. In verse 20, it says, and it's been giving this description. Verse 20 says, These are the living beings that I saw beneath the God of Israel by the river Chabar, so I knew that they were cherubim. So the description that you're given in, the, in chapter 1 and chapter 10, that you're going to see the two sound almost identical, it tells you very specifically in verse 20, these are cherry beam. Okay, so we get an idea what cherry beam look like. And they're not these little cute chubby face. <laughs> They've got six wings. Find out what they do with two of them. Some of you may know, but find out what they do with two of them. Okay, I'm trying to tell why it's on purpose. Um, and let's go real quick to Revelation 4. Revelation 4, remember when I gave you the outline of Revelation earlier in this class today? I said chapter 4 starts up with the things which will be after the church age. It's a picture of us being caught up into heaven when Yohanan John is called up. Um, well, verse 1, after these things I looked, John looked, and behold, hello, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And we know that heaven opens to us when we're raptured. The first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet, we know we're caught up by the sound of a trumpet, speaking with me, with John, said, come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after these things. Now, you've got after these things twice in this verse, and after these things in Revelation 119 that gave that outline. So we know that we're following, we're keeping it, you know, in context, and we're understanding it. So after the things that were present in chapters 2 and 3, the church age. After that, then, here we go, we're caught up, and we may hear these very same words that John heard, come up here. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to hear. All I know is I'll, I'll steal Patsy out. Claremont's <laughs> words. He toots, I scoot. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so whatever it is, it'll be so fast in that twinkling of an eye, we'll find ourselves in heaven. Is it the trumpet that looks like? Straight. I think it'll be. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. You think it's a shofar? I think it's a shofar. That's what you said. I think it's a shofar. That's that's a shofar. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a shofar because he's the Lamb of God and the the Ram that has the horn. And that's the sound it's we the know. Picture. You know, that's the sound You're we know. The one that, we don't know, said, the, no, it's a we don't know the silver trumpet how it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> and there are trumpets blown all the time that are silver. That, so. But, but I'm not being no, but that's okay. I'm not saying, oh, I know. <laughs> okay? But here we go now, verses, and this is what I'll end on for today, verses 6 through 8. Uh, before the throne, and you see, we've got our heavenly scene. We're seeing the throne in heaven. Before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass. Remember, I read that in Revelation 22, like crystal. In the center and around the throne, the four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind <clears throat> The first creature was like the lion, what, what am I, okay, it gives a description, the lion, the calf, the man, and the eagle, um, okay, okay, here we go, verse 8, and the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, okay, sure hand, six wings, somebody's saying it here, she's yeah. done her homework already, <laughs> are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, and here's what's known about the cherry beam, always with the cherry beam, holy Holy, wow. holy, in my Hebrew, wow. kadosh, 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 is the Lord God, wow. the Almighty. If I read it all to you in Hebrew, it would be kadosh, kadosh, kadosh is, and I'd have to look it up, but probably Adonai El-Gabor. <coughs> El 
because that's Lord God Almighty. I see my Hebrew all over mm -hmm. this. Who was and who is and who is to come. Verse 9 tells us they give glory and honor and thanks to the one who sits on the throne. The cherry beam are always, it seems in scripture, always surrounding the holiness of God. Wow. They're always in relation to the holiness. Keep that in mind. How are we going to tie that into the fact that they're at the entrance to the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve have just been told, go. They've just mm -hmm. been set out. Remember, they were driven out. How does that relate? Why am I bringing that up? I think there's an interesting mm. thought here. Can't be dogmatic, but we will see the purpose of the cherry beam, why they are there, what is being said at this point. <laughs> Got to throw in a little humor for you in the end. Sunday school class, children were told, draw a picture of your favorite Bible story. Teacher's walking around the room watching everybody coloring, and she comes up behind little Tommy, and he's drawing a picture of a car, and it has a man in the front, Driving <coughs> has two people sitting in the back seat. She looks at that. She tries to think for a minute. She can't figure out any relation to any Bible story. Nothing she'd been teaching little Tommy. And so she said to him, Tommy, you're not supposed to just draw a picture. You're supposed to draw a picture about your, your favorite Bible story. And he says, well, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a picture of Bible story. She says, well, what Bible story is this? And he looked at her. He says, well, this is God driving Adam and Eve out of the garden. <laughs> <laughs> For all the little boys who want vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> You do know that the Lord drove an accord, don't you? Because they all went out one accord. <laughs> oh, what a bad day. <laughs> There's a few more like that too, but I'll stop here. <laughs> okay, we'll pick it back up next week. We'll talk about, uh, just slightly, not in any depth, about a couple other types of angels, but we will talk about the cherry beam, their association with the holiness of God, with the throne of God, with mercy seat, and we'll see what they're representing here at the gateway to the Garden of Eden. Okay? So I hope that makes you want to come back. Class went far too fast for me. I don't know about you, but it's over before I feel like we began. <laughs> but I trust it's been a blessing to you. Um, we do, we always want to keep our, our thumb, you know, our heartbeat on what is current because the Word of God is current. Even when we're studying what happened in the beginning, it relates to today. So I trust looking at current events and what's going on and the picture from Scripture. I am not here to push my view. You all know my view, but I'm here to push the Scriptures. And I will encourage you, if your boat's rocking, if you're a little concerned, get into the Word of God. He will show you the truth and you will have your peace there, no matter what. So. Any comments, questions before we close in prayer? Okay, we'll open up the discussion right after. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Adonai Elohim El Gabor. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And you are Adonai Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, and we thank you that that host is even the armies that we believe will include us one day when we come back with you. Oh, how we praise you and thank you for your word, how we long to be in your throne room with our whole bodies, not just as we go in spirit, but we long to be there, to be at home with you forever and ever. We thank you for your word to tell us. We thank you that we do know the final chapter. We thank you that we know your faithfulness to Israel and your faithfulness to the church age. We thank you, Lord, that even when we see the curse of sin, that you have sent redemption and the way of salvation from the very beginning, that we even know we will see Adam and Eve in heaven one day with us because you made the way of redemption for them. We thank you for the long-suffering. We don't deserve it. We thank you for your mercy and your grace and that they're poured out freely, that your mercies are new every morning and your grace is sufficient for whatever we need, that we're told to run into your throne room for grace and mercy. Lord, you are awesome. You are amazing. Yes. And I don't know how you do it, but I know I love you more than when I started at this class today because somehow you make the capacity larger. Take our hearts, Lord, see our love, know that we are yours, and may we be holy, living, and acceptable unto you, which is just our reasonable service because you've done it all and you're worth it all. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. Bless and be with, uh, with each one. 
throughout the time that we are apart until we are together again and until we are together forever with you. Thank you for that sure promise. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 And all God's people said, Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Amen.